Hello, I'm Kirsty Young, and this is a podcast from the Desert Island Discs Archive. For rights reasons, we've had to shorten the music. The programme was originally broadcast in 2004, and the presenter was Sue Lawley. My castaway this week is a satirist. For the past 12 years, he's appeared regularly on television as one half of a wittily toe-curling conversational duet. A cynical spin doctor, clueless toff, ruthless businessman or one of many other alter egos, he and his partner, John Bird, skillfully reveal the absurdities and inconsistencies of modern British life. For him, it's been a return to frontline show business after a long absence. A member of the group of iconoclasts that came out of Cambridge at the turn of the 60s, he was one of the talents with Peter Cook behind the Establishment Club in Soho and wrote for and appeared regularly on the new genre of satirical television shows such as Not So Much a Programme, More A Way of Life. Born in Bristol 65 years ago, he might never have made it to Cambridge and the glittering footlights but for an English teacher who encouraged and inspired him. He's more responsible, he says, than anyone else in my life for anything I've achieved. He is John Fortune. What was his name then, John, this English master? And what was his he name was uh, Teddy Martin, also called Sandy Martin. And he was in his late 40s, I suppose, when I was about 15. And I was pretty average at school, and that's uh, flattering. And then one day, Teddy came into an English class and, without saying anything at all, started to read the four quartets of T.S. Eliot, and something happened, and it changed my life. What happened? I don't know. I'd never heard anything like this, and the fact that it was poetry, the fact that it was modern, the fact that I couldn't understand it but desperately wanted to was extremely important. And from that moment, I became very, very good at writing about poetry and literature, and Teddy encouraged me. But you hadn't really read much before, then, didn't no, you? No, no. In our house, we had two books. One was called The Universal Home Doctor, and the other was called The Universal Book of Hobbies. And uh, that was it. So did he kind of take you under his wing? Did he give you books? Yes, did he... he did. He took me home to his house after school one night, and it was the first time I'd ever seen a room which had books from the floor to the ceiling. And he had a a car, and he filled up the back seat with books and said, when you've finished this lot, come and get some more. And did he inspire you then to apply for Cambridge? Is that Yes, he did. Yes, yes, he did. And I was at a very eccentric school, the Cathedral School in Bristol. Why eccentric? Uh, Well, because the headmaster was extremely eccentric. (laughs) He... He encouraged me to take an exam for St. Catherine's College, Cambridge, which I took in the Cathedral Library. And about three weeks later, I said, have you heard anything from Cambridge? And he said, oh, 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 God, I forgot to send the papers. (laughs) Uh, So he was that eccentric. But you did eventually go up to Cambridge, didn't you, to to, to do your exams and be interviewed for sort of three days? Yes, I went to King's. Yes. And I didn't know King's, except when I saw the chapel, I remembered that... um, In the Radio Times, there was an advertisement for Pi Radios, and it had a picture of King's College Chapel. I thought, oh, that's the Pi Radio place. (laughs) uh, So I was there for three days, and uh, it was absolutely wonderful. I remember the night before the first exam, I was staying in a student's room, just looking in the bookshelves, and there was a paperback book of James Thurber. And I opened it. I'd never heard of James Thurber. And I started to laugh. And that was a wonderful moment. Amazing. Let's have your first record. Tell me about that. Oh, this is uh, Thomas Tallis. Um, It is 40-part motet, Spemin Allium, and this is sung by the Choir of Kings.
Part of Thomas Tallis' Spem in Allium, sung by the choir of King's College, Cambridge, led by Stephen Cleavery. And members of Cambridge in the late 50s for my castaway, John Fortune. It was a watershed in his life. Presumably, John, for a working-class boy from Bristol, I mean, it was full of untold exoticism. Absolutely amazing. I mean, in my first year, well, I suppose my first term, um, I had sexual intercourse for the first time. I tasted claret. I tasted whiskey, brandy. I had spaghetti that wasn't out of a tin. I had coffee that was ground, aubergines, courgettes. It was amazing. I must have spent the whole year just eating and drinking <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and making up. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, um, but your timing was also perfect uh, in a sense because, of course, it was just at the moment, wasn't it, when the working class was becoming very fashionable. So, yes, know, it was. Angry um, young men and hurry yes. on down and room at the top. I mean, you'd have been really in there. Well, I was um, in, in every sense. Um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the fact that at home we had a, an outside lavatory and no bathroom, was just catnip to upper-class young girls who'd been to Cranbourne Chase and uh, all that sort of thing. (laughs) They like to hear you talk dirty. Oh, absolutely, (laughs) yes. Did you actually go outside to have a pee in the middle of the night? (laughs) Certainly. But a a wonderful, different atmosphere from the atmosphere you'd left behind in Bristol, which I do want to talk to you about. Yes. Just Uh, free and liberal. Yes, King's was the first college in Cambridge to take the spikes off the, the gates and the railings. And I used to always climb in with my girlfriend on a Saturday night, and I'd climb over first, and then she would climb over very decorously in these sort of 50s hoop skirts, you know, that sort of thing. And as she landed on the gravel, there would be the voice of the porter from the shadow of the buttress of the chapel saying, Well jumped, miss. <laughs> oh, wonderful. You were taught by F.R. Levis, yes? Uh, yes, and uh, I wanted to have supervision with him. And uh, eventually, Frank Levis said, well, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, you're from King's. King's. I remember walking up King's Parade and seeing Lytton Strachey with Dady Rylands on one arm and Rupert Brooke on the other, and I didn't know where to put myself. <laughs> You make him sound like Enoch Powell. Well, he was. Was I mean, he was a bit like that. He was very puritanical. But he was a wonderful man. And E.M. Forster was a fellow. Now, I mean, Kings was his permanent home. Yes, it was. He He lived there. He would have been, what, nearly 80 by then? Yes, I suppose he was. But he was very, very charming. I had a great friend who lived in the rooms above his um, in Kings. And one night he knocked on my friend's door and said, I'm awfully sorry to uh, to interrupt your lovemaking, but could you do it a little more quiet? <laughs> Wonderful. I have to ask you, in talking about Levis, uh, <clears throat> did you learn from him about satire and that satire was about moral judgments, and have you borne this in mind ever since? Um, I, I certainly, at that time, was very influenced by Levis's uh, very rigorous view about um, society and the great tradition and all that. As I've got older and, and more decadent, I've <laughs> sort of rather left those beliefs behind. I like to think that what John and I do is um, ridicule our betters. Record number two. This is uh, Pablo Casals playing the Song of the Birds. And this is because I suppose I was introduced to music because uh, of my father. I didn't really know my father very well because when I was very tiny, he went off to the war and I really didn't see him again until I was six. But he played the cello, so I'd like to hear Pablo Casals and remember my father. Thank you. 
Pablo Casals and the Catalan folk song, The Song of the Birds. It is fascinating, John, that your image today, which of course is completely false because it's drawn from your kind of satirical appearances, but nevertheless, it is consistently one of being sort of upmarket, buffer. Somebody called you, I think, a sort of ineffectual Latin master. <laughs> <laughs> but it is the complete antithesis <clears throat> of your origins, isn't it? That's what's fascinating. Well, it is, and I know that whenever I do something... My wife says to me, try not to sound up a class. So your father was a, a travelling salesman, wasn't he? Yes, he was, he uh, was. Um, and your mother, did she work? Uh, no, no. She worked before she got married. She worked in a dress shop. And oddly enough, I have a middle name, Courtney. And I used to say to her, why on earth do you call me Courtney? And she said, well, he was the man that owned the dress shop and he was the only rich man I've ever met. And you lived in a, a little two-up, two-down, as you say, yes. outside lavatory, but then you moved into a bigger house. We moved into a bigger house because my grandfather died and my grandmother and my mother's brother decided that they'd like to sell their house and move in with us, which, which in fact, they did. Mm. It was quite difficult because my grandmother wasn't a particularly nice woman. My uncle used to go off to work at 9 o'clock in the morning, and five minutes later she would start to boil the cabbage. And so by lunchtime it was just appalling. <laughs> you can smell it now. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so if you were, as you say, under the influence of this, this uh, school teacher and you were beginning to learn <clears throat> about literature and art mm -hmm. and how to think and so Presumably, the desire to escape was at the front of your mind, was it? Well, I remember when I was at my primary school, I think uh, we had an interview with the headmaster, Mr Elton, and he said to my mother, there's no reason why John shouldn't go to university, even Oxford or Cambridge, and you wouldn't have to pay a penny. And I never forgot that. Mm. I was educated at King's for three years, and at the beginning of each uh, year, the uh, bursar used to come to my room and say, oh, um, I've got the money for your exhibition um, here. Would you like it in cash or wine? <laughs> what did you take? <laughs> I used to take the cash, I'm afraid. What, just <laughs> now loaded, loaded the cash <laughs> big, on you then? Yeah, yeah. And then those great big white notes. Old five-pound uh, yes, notes. Yes, that's right. Number three. In my teens, I got very, very keen on, on jazz. And uh, I joined the Air Training Corps because they had a silver wing band and they gave me a trombone and sort of taught me to play it. Except that the very first time we had a parade and we were marching along with a huge crowd behind us and the music began slipping in the lyre that screwed to the trombone. And I tried to grab it and let go of the slide, which just fell off and <laughs> 2,000 people tramped over it. But this record, um, this is just... Uh... Louis Armstrong and Ain't Misbehaving recorded live at the Town Hall, New York, in 1947. Your Cambridge timing was right for other reasons, too, wasn't it, uh, John? Not just that working class was fashionable, but that the footlights were moving into their kind of satirical heyday. A lot of people who were to become very famous were around. I mean, shall I drop some names for you? David Frost, Peter Cook, Jonathan Miller, Eleanor Bron, and, of course... John Bird. And John Bird, absolutely. <laughs> and in fact, in my first year at Cambridge, he directed the footlights, and being very rigorous, um, John, every sketch in it ended with death. <laughs> so that was a departure. And then I directed the uh, footlights in my second year and wrote most of it with Peter Cook. And uh, those were really great days. But... Until that point, most Footlights reviews have been about bedmakers and punts and um, putting chamber pots on top of a chapel and that kind of thing. But how would you characterise how you changed it and what did you bring to it if you did away with the bedmakers? I suppose what we uh, brought to it was um, very, very much influenced by Peter. So it was that sort of surreal Going Comedy. off at tangents. Absolutely. Bizarre. I mean, I can't remember why, but the one that I directed was called, for some reason, Pop Goes Mrs Jessup. Now, why that would be the case, I have absolutely But it makes us laugh no immediately, idea. doesn't it? Yes. yes. Well, but he know. was a huge... He was an outstanding... <clears throat> something completely different, wasn't he? Yes, he race? was. He huh? was. And uh, I had the luck to work with him at uh, Cambridge, and then when I left, he opened this club called The Establishment 
And I was going to direct it and write it with John Bird, and we'd get some actors in to do it, and we'd spend every night at the Café Royal counting our checks. <laughs> <laughs> and we had, a, we had two days of auditions, and uh, we couldn't find anybody. I mean, we found Barry Humphreys, but Barry isn't really a team player, mm. you know. But anyway, so um, Peter said, well, we can't get any actors. You'll have to do it yourself. So we did. Mm. And we spent uh, a year in London. This was in, in Soho. In Soho. In Greek Street, wasn't That's it? Right. And And it, it was hugely successful. Hugely successful. Steamy, smoky, full of people. Yes, uh, because as Peter saw, everybody wanted to become a member of the establishment. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Record number four. This is Peter. This is Peter Cook and Dudley Moore. And... Dudley is interviewing Peter, who is the proprietor of a less than successful restaurant out in the wilds of moorland, miles from anywhere, called the Frog and Peach. There's no parking problem here, situated as we are in the middle of a bog in the, <laughs> in the heart of Dartmoor. Yes. No difficulty parking, some difficulty extricating your car, but otherwise <laughs> well situated. Yes. Good but evening. Good evening. Uh, don't you feel, again, you're at a disadvantage because of your menu? I mean, The you're menu? Up... Oh, this has been a terrible hindrance to us, building up a business. <laughs> the menu is the most appalling thing. It's, uh, there's so little to choose from. You I can mean, start uh, with what's there? Spawn cocktail. Spawn cocktail. <laughs> Peter Cook and Dudley Moore and Frog and Peach from Not Only But Also in uh, 1966. So, John Fortune, you were writing and directing and performing, and yes. from all the history you've described, you were obviously one of the architects of the so-called 60s satire boom. Um, but then all three of you, Bird, Cook and you, managed to miss out on the kind of popular birth of this thing, which, of course, was on television. With That was the week that was. Where were you? What happened? Well, what, what happened now? was that... Originally, uh, that was the week that was was going to be the establishment on television. And we were uh, offered a tour of America. We did one pilot with John Bird doing the David Frost role, but we went to America and we had our own club in, in New York. And in the meantime, that was the week started, and I remember David Frost coming to New York and actually saying to me, I wonder if I should... Um, build on this success and go into Parliament. <laughs> but, uh, alas for Parliament, he never did. <laughs> so by the time you came back, the something was happening. Yes, absolutely. And you, you lot had missed out. Well, uh, to some extent, although the subsequent programmes, not so much a programme, more way of life, and then The Late Show and BBC Three, we did take part in those. Yes, yes, yes of course. Yes, I mean, well, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> yes, you did, didn't you? you did. Yes. <laughs> record number five. Uh, record number five. This, this takes me back to New York and the establishment there, because when we arrived there, the manager said, um, I realise you need a trio because you've got a girl who's going to sing. But we don't have a lot of money, and so I've had to uh, hire some black musicians. I hope you don't mind. And I said, well, we don't, no. Um, And he said, but the piano player can play. His name is Teddy Wilson. And this would be like me saying to you, the sound recordist next door is is someone called Richard Dimbleby. It was absolutely amazing to me. Every night he would play... And he'd always say, what would you like me to play? And I'd say, play something you used to do with Billie Holiday and uh, Lester Young. And he could never remember because he'd done so many. But this this record is Billie Holiday singing, and it's easy to blame the weather. Easy to blame the weather When I think of the sun, it scares me My one alibi will pass and springtime I hear is early this year They'll see through me like glass I see no reason for this breakup So let me be the first to make up If a reason must be had It's easy to blame the weather 
Billie Holiday with Teddy Wilson and his orchestra and it's easy to blame the weather. Turning to the two Johns then, John Fortune as opposed to John Bird, the trick is really that it's non-confrontational, isn't it? You talk to each other and, 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 and gently and almost affably expose the absurdity of any given issue. Yes, it's, it should be a helpful conversation. And uh, we take it in turns to be George Parr, who's the person who's usually uh, defending the indefensible. And he's always called George Parr, yes, always, whoever he is. Yes, yes. absolutely. Um, and so we don't say, come off it, Mr Parr. You must know that what you've said is... that We say, no, it's very, very interesting. Now, why exactly has the government decided to do it this way? And in the um, the easiest forms... I mean, for example, British defence policy. You don't have to make jokes about it. You only have to describe it, and it's extremely funny, as long as you don't try and challenge the absurdity of it. So if you just say, well, tell us about the Eurofighter, the fact that it's a joint venture and Spain and ourselves are building... Uh, one wing of the aeroplane, we build half each. And it wasn't for years and years until they put them together that they realised that we were doing it in inches and they were doing it in centimetres. So our bit was twice as big as theirs. And this, you don't have to make this up. You don't it's create true. the absurdity, no, it is absurd. Just, yes. And you don't write it, do you? You kind of, it's, we, How we, much on the hoof is it? Well, we have a framework. And you don't rehearse it? No, we don't, because we are the laziest people in the world. We have an argument, we know where we're starting and we know where we're finishing. Laziness is not the reason, though, is it? That in a sense, you'd, you'd preempt the jokes. Somehow, you've just got to lean back and let it happen. Yes, I think you, you do, and yeah. you have to have the confidence for doing that. Yes. And, uh, and, that, and that takes a lot of confidence. Yes, less so now, because people seem to like what we do, and we've never, touch wood, broken down and completely failed. You do corpse, though. Yes, and I'm very ashamed of that because I... No, you're not. No, I am. It's always I quite am. a good moment. <laughs> well, people say that. But the thing is that because we haven't heard what each of us is going to say always, if someone comes up with something that we've never heard before and strikes us, it's very, very funny. It's very mm, difficult to keep a straight face. And no. do you prefer being George Parr or his um, interlocutor? I don't mind. In some ways, if you're asking the questions, if you're the interviewer, you think, oh, well, it's not my job to get the jokes this week. Yes, I, I must <laughs> say, I would have thought it would be more difficult to be George Parr. Yes, we take it strictly in turn. Oh, do you? Yes, yes. So which week do you prefer? Um, I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, don't, I mean, I like it both. I like, I like the relaxation of not... Having to be funny, if you see what I mean. Yes. On the other hand, if I do think it's funny, I enjoy doing it. Record number six. I'm a Scarlatti freak. And this came about when I was doing a play in the West End. And opposite the stage door was a wonderful shop called Cheapo Cheapo Records. And it had thousands of LPs. And I used to go in there all the time and buy wildly romantic music. And I think I must have been talking to John Bird because he's desperately rigorous and ascetic and thinking, I've got to be more like John. So I went into this place and I saw um, a record of 14 sonatas by Domenico Scarlatti played on the harpsichord and I thought that's like uh, having a cold bath. You know, it couldn't be more ascetic and rigorous than that. And, of mm. course, discovered that Scarlatti is the most wildly sensual, romantic composer of all.
part of Scarlatti's sonata in A major, played by Scott Ross. So, John Fortune, you can't ask everybody about their politics, but I can ask you, where, where do you put yourself in the political spectrum? Um, pretty far to the left. I would like to describe myself as a as a socialist. Party. Radical left. Yes, yes. I, I, I suppose so. Um, Does that mean that although you shoot holes in his government every week, that you will vote for Tony Blair at the next election? No, I will not. Uh, ah. No. Uh, what I'd like... The what next do you vote, then, if you're of your political hue? It's, it's terribly difficult. My recommendation to everyone uh, listening out there would be... Um, I hope this is a joke. <laughs> <laughs> is at the next election not to vote at all. Oh, no right. one. Yes. No one votes. Is this is this a sort of absurd proposition, or are we to listen to this very seriously? Please listen very seriously. <laughs> <laughs> it is a problem, though, isn't it? Because, you know, you are a satirist. <clears throat> uh, the, the show that you do with John Bird and, and with Rory Bremner is, you know, is put forward as an, uh, an entertainment. And yet, at the same time, it is political comment. It's serious comment. And, I, you know, the, the line gets blurred between the two, and that's difficult. Yes, it is. I, I mean, I would, I would hate for people to think, oh, well, this is just a rant. It, it has to be funny. It has to be entertaining, mm. because otherwise people won't listen and it won't affect them. But if you get too serious, it ceases to be entertaining, surely. Well, exactly, and that's what we try not to do. Yes, but you are... Political commentators masquerading as satirists, actually. That's where it's got to now. I'm happy with that. Are um, you? <laughs> I mean, you shouldn't be. I, I'm happy with masquerading. <laughs> um, no, I think that as long as we make people laugh, that's the main purpose. And also, I wouldn't really like to spend my life um, doing anything other than having a good laugh with my closest friend. Record number seven. <laughs> One of the nicest things about being in show business is that you do meet a lot of people and you don't have to spend a lot of time with any of them. I remember my father worked for this company for 36 years and uh, he couldn't stand the other people in the... <laughs> 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 <That's a very laughs> good Whereas if I do uh, a television series for, for six weeks, at the end of it, I never have to see anyone again. But um, I, I worked a lot with Eleanor Braun, who's another very, very close friend. But luckily you don't have to see her too I often. Don't, I don't have to see her, no. Um, <laughs> except I am seeing her. <laughs> uh, anyway, she recommended to me... Brahms is uh, chamber music, and I, I love it. Opening of Brahms' String Sextet No. 1 in B flat, played by Jean Claude Penetier, Regis Pasquier, Raphael Oleg Bruno Pasquier, Jean Dupuy, Roland Pidou, and Etienne Picklar. And they didn't have a kind of, um, you know, name of a sextet, so I'm afraid they all have to be known. There they go. Um, well how, does, uh, how does a satirist cope on a desert island? Does he just sit there and think how absurd? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I wouldn't cope very well, I have to say. I used to have a screwdriver, but my wife, Emma, buried it in the garden in case I ever was tempted to use it. She couldn't bear it, so I'm hopeless. I should have asked you, by the way, what did your English master, the, the Teddy Martin, think about what became of his protégé? He was, he was keen. Just before um, I left Cambridge, I talked to him and he said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to join the Workers' Educational Association and bring Yates to the coalfields. And he said, well, that's wonderful. 
And I had a, an interview with the WEA, and they said, well, you can do that, and we'll pay you six pounds a week. And then Peter rang me up and said, we'll pay you 20 pounds a week to come and tell jokes. <laughs> so uh, I'm afraid it all went. <laughs> but Teddy Martin gave you the thumbs up. Yes. Last record. This is Beethoven's Piano Sonata number 30, Opus 109. And this is played by an American great pianist called Richard Good. And I'm, I've chosen this because this was the first present I gave my wife, Emma, when I met her. I met her just before Christmas, about um, 15 years ago. I absolutely fell in love with her immediately, and I gave her this record as a Christmas present. Beethoven's Piano Sonata Number 30 in E major, played by Richard Good. Now, if you could only take one of those eight records, John, which one would you take? I'd take the Beethoven. And your book, as well as the Bible of Shakespeare? This may be a slight cheek, but I'd like to have a novel called The Leopard by Giuseppe Tommasi di Lampedusa. But if I possibly could, could I have it in English and Italian? Because maybe by the time I get off this island, I might know a bit of Italian. Why not? And your luxury? My luxury, I think what I'd like, actually, is a very old, very beautiful rug made by the Baluch people of Afghanistan. And I could sit on this, and um, in strong sunlight, the wonderful colours would be tremendous. And I'd sit and watch the horizon. John Fortune, thank you very much indeed for letting us hear your Desert Island Discs. Thank you. You've been listening to a podcast from the Desert Island Discs archive. For more podcasts, please visit bbc.co.uk slash radio4. Thank you.